I'm Larry Barsh, and you are listening to Specifically for Seniors, the podcast for those of us in the Remember When generation. Today's podcast is available wherever you listen to podcasts and in video and audio on Spotify and on the Specifically for Seniors YouTube channel. Today's guest on Specifically for Seniors is Diane Diamond. Diane has enjoyed an award-winning career in radio and television news. She is the recipient of the American Bar Association Silver Gavel Award. Perhaps you know her from her coverage of some of the nation's biggest stories, including the murder of John Benet Ramsey, the Michael Jackson case, the O.J. Simpson murder case, and the Bush-Gore election recount in Florida. In a career that has included NPR, CNBC, Court TV, MSNBC, and The Today Show. Diane is the author of three books on the criminal justice system. And now, welcome to Specifically for Seniors, Diane. Thanks so much, Larry. I I need to pay you as my agent. Thanks for that intro. Oh, any time. The Britney Spears conservatorship put the spotlight on an issue that has been on your mind for many years. Sure did. Yeah. Uh, You know, back in 2015, I was, I'm still writing a syndicated column on crime and justice issues. And I got a call from an old friend of mine back in Albuquerque, New Mexico, my hometown. And she told me this story about her father being put under guardianship. And I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Uh, I mean, you, the court can come in and take over a person's life and put a complete stranger in charge of that person's life and take their civil rights away. I thought maybe my friend had gone bonkers or something, but I started to check out this system called guardianship, which is in effect in all 50 states. Some states like California call it conservatorship. And I realized this is a tremendous flaw in the justice system. And so I started gathering cases of, um, is frankly, exploitive guardianships where people's lives were being turned upside down and that all their money being spent on total strangers to take care of them. And I wrote a lot about it in my syndicated column. And once I did, the floodgates opened and I heard from people all over the United States that this was happening to them or their loved ones. And so ever since 2015, I've been gathering stories putting it all together, and I'm in the process of just um, releasing a book on the topic. I I hope everybody who's interested in this will grab a copy when it comes out. It's called The Racket, and that's what it is, Larry. It is a racket. Can you explain exactly what guardianship is? Yes. It is a system that involves the court in an individual's life, and then once there's a court order, that's the law of the land. Here's how it usually happens. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let's say there is a widow. Her children have a, an argument about what to do with mom. You know, what, should she stay in the house? Should she go into a nursing home? Should one of us take her in? And they begin to bicker about it. And frequently, one of these brothers or sisters will go to a lawyer. Hey, what do I do with mom? How come my brother wants to do this? I don't want to do that. And the lawyers they usually go to are an elder law attorney, uh, an estate attorney, someone like that. And they're frequently told, hey, here's the panacea. Let's go get your mother put into guardianship or conservatorship because then you can be the guardian. You'll, you'll, we'll get to the courthouse first and the judge will name you as the guardian. Frankly, Larry, that doesn't happen all the time. A judge, you know, has got a full docket and he says, wait a minute, there is dissension within the families, there's dysfunction. I'm not gonna name one of the family members to be the guardian, I'm gonna name a complete stranger, a for-profit guardian that charges up to $600 an hour 
They can charge 150, 200, some charge $600 an hour. And that person will take over your mother's life for her because you guys are all bickering and you can't figure it out. Well, that guardian and or conservator, they may also appoint a conservator who just handles the finances and a guardian handles the personal part of, a, of someone's life, like their medical and where they live and all that. That person uh, has tremendous power. They can tell the brothers and sisters, you know what, you upset the family, you, you upset the, the now ward of the court, and so I'm going to bar you from seeing your mother because you upset her. And so in, it's a system that is supposed to help families cope with their most vulnerable, at-risk people, but it, in many instances, tears families completely apart. Now, having said that, let me just say, there are some great, wonderful guardians, conservators, judges in this system, and, and it works out just fine, usually when a family member is named as the guardian. But more and more frequently, that's not happening, and this whole cottage industry of guardians, conservators, the health aides that they hire, the, the whole um, staff of people are paid for out of the ward's estate. So you can imagine what happens to inheritances. They don't go to the heirs where they want them to go. They go to pay total strangers who've come in and taken over their lives. So this is a lot more involved than just a, a simple power of attorney. That's right. That's right. And, and that you just touched on a really important part here. When you are guardianized, you go before a judge and the judge says, I'm going to give you a guardian. You are stripped of your civil rights. You cannot hire a lawyer. You cannot travel without permission. You can't say where you want to live. Sometimes they make you change doctors. Sometimes they put you in a home you don't want to be in. You have lost all your civil rights. And all of the documents that you have prepared, a will, a power of attorney, uh, an ir irrevocable trust, uh, end of life directives, they can all be ignored by the guardian. All the guardian has to do is go to the judge and say, you know, the power of attorney is with Sister Mary, but uh, Mary upsets the ward. And Mary, I think Mary might be stealing some money. So I want permission to just remove Mary hmm. as the POA. And boom, that elders, m most of the people under guardianship are older, um, their wishes are erased. Their will can be ignored, their POA can be ignored, and this is all done with a judge's permission. So there's no recourse. You can't go to the local police and say, hey, help me out here, because it's not a criminal matter, it's a civil matter in a court of equity. And those are very different than, say, a criminal court. They have completely different rules that just let the judge kind of do whatever they want. And the family has no recourse in this? Well, they can hire their own attorney and they can fight it. Um, good luck finding an attorney that wants to take on other attorneys <laughs> and take on this whole system. Um, and you can spend all of your retirement, all of your savings, just trying to fight this. Is there recourse? Um, I'd like to say yes. You know, go before the court and, and tell the judge your side of the story. But frequently, the judges don't want to hear from you. They don't have time. They're listening to their own court appointee, their guardian, the conservator, the, something called a court visitor, uh, a mental health evaluator. They're listening to them. They're not listening to the family because in the back of their mind, they say, this family is dysfunctional. I don't need to listen to them. They're a mess. We need to come in and take it over. So it's really hard to challenge it once it's in effect. So... It's easy to start a guardianship? Yeah, very easy to start and really hard to get out of. It's a real tar baby situation. Uh, this is how a guardianship starts. Somebody goes to an attorney and the attorney draws up a petition for guardianship. Sometimes it's called an emergency petition for guardianship and they put it before the court. That's all it takes. Um, now, it can be a member of a family that, that starts this petition process, but in my many years of research, Larry, you can't believe some of the people who have brought 
petitions of guardianship. Uh, for example, in the state of Texas, there was a wealthy man, uh, older man, a little dementia. He had um, uh, antique cars and he had a local mechanic fixing his antique cars and he forgot to pay him. He was a wealthy man, but he, he just forgot to pay the man, owed him $40,000. A mechanic went to court with a petition to guardianship this man so he could get his money. And the court granted it. Took that family about $100,000 and at least a year to fight that and get their loved one out of guardianship. But that's how simple it is. A next door neighbor can say, oh, hey, there, Larry Barsh, I haven't seen him lately. I, and they call the police and say, can you do a welfare check on Larry Barsh? The police will come, but they'll come with adult protective services. Adult Protective Services can then file a petition with the court to guardianize Larry Barsh because we went into the house and, you know, it was kind of messy and he didn't have very much food in the refrigerator and he obviously needs help. Boom, you're in guardianship. You're in temporary guardianship. But once you're in, temporary becomes permanent pretty quickly. And it's hard to remove this. Yeah. It's really, really hard. Uh, I have in the book chapters about people that do desperate things. They're so desperate to help their loved one. They'll, uh, they'll take them away from the home in which they've been put, or um, they'll grab them at a doctor's office when they've gone for a, an appointment and you know, take them to the local Denny's for breakfast or something. And then they're caught, and then they're charged with felony kidnapping. There's case after case, especially Larry, I hate to say, in your state of Florida, where people who uh, think they're truly believe that they're rescuing their loved one, and the law doesn't see it that way. You have defied a court order, you have defied the guardian or conservator, and you must pay. People have gone to jail for it. I know in Florida they started a new law uh, enacted in 2020. Mm -hmm. Uh, that provides for enhanced reporting requirements for guardians. Uh, it says that the necessity of guardians to secure court approval before signing a DNR, mm -hmm. guardians must be related to the allegedly incapacitated person. Right. I'm not a lawyer, but this seems pretty vague protection. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, you read these new laws and there states across the country are passing these little band-aid laws rather than fixing the system they're saying well let's make a guardian report more or let's do this or let's and you read these new laws and you think wasn't this shouldn't this has already been the case that a guardian has to report where they've spent the ward's money and they have to file that annual report and uh, you know, it's um, it's amazing to me as I try to keep up with the new legislation or proposed legislation in all 50 states, how basic these things are. Uh, you know, you, you hit on something really important there on the DNR, the do not resuscitate orders. This is how powerful a guardian can be. In your state of Florida, there was a guardian uh, who is still awaiting trial as we speak now. Her name was Rebecca Farrelly. And Rebecca Farrelly had so many wards appointed to her, hundreds, 400, all over the state. There's no way one guardian can uh, uh, visit and regulate the lives of 400 people, but that's what she had. And so to, I guess, help manage her caseload, she would just put do not resuscitate orders on the ward's charts in the hospital. And she did this to a, a veteran who had a non-life-threatening problem, but he couldn't swallow well. Mm -hmm. She put a DNR on his chart against his wishes, against his daughter's wishes, and she further ordered that his food tube, to bypass the swallowing problem, his food to be capped if there was an emergency. And this man died. And with the hospital staff standing by, unable to do anything because of the DNR, and his food tube was capped, and he slowly, over the next week, died. So she is up on several felony counts right now. And again, this is how powerful 
a unscrupulous guardian can be. They're, again, fabulous guardians. They, del they dedicate their lives to helping other people. But there has come to pass, a, this, this system has morphed into something that's really, really ugly. It can be really, really ugly. Uh, you mentioned felony charges. That was another thing in the Florida law. There didn't seem to be any statement about criminal background of a guardian or conflict of interest of a guardian. That's right. That's right. You, you know, most states don't require, no state requires a guardian to be licensed. No, a uh, few states, I think only 13, require them to get a certificate of training. So, you know, these are people that are put in charge of other, other person's lives. They don't have any, they don't have to have any accounting background, elder health care uh, background, um, uh, uh, family dynamic, so, sociology or psychology background. They don't have to have, you have to be like 18 years old and a U.S. citizen and not be a felon. Well, background checks are very lax. There have been felons atta uh, attached to people who, who have become their guardians. And the whole system, Larry, is a mishmash mess, depending on the state you're in. And, you know, some of the reform activists want the federal government to step in. You know, good luck with that. And, and can I make one more point? We're talking now, because of, of your audience, about seniors being guardianized. In 2015, when I first started investigating this, it was elders. It, it, that's all I found. The, the people in unwanted, exploitive guardianships were older people with money, by the way. They always have to have money because that's the, that's the point of this with the uh, greedy guardians, the guardians who are greedy. But um, over the years, I've discovered the target audience for the, <clears throat> excuse me, the unscrupulous are, it's, it's ever widening. It's now people like Britney Spears. It's people, young people who have inherited some money from grandpa or grandma. Suddenly they've got this pile of money and they become a prime target. There are people who've won workman's compensation settlements or uh, medical malpractice settlements. They become very ripe targets for this unscrupulous group. I have even found women in contested divorces where the opposing attorney will say to the husband, hey, you know what? She won't settle. So let's, I'll tell you what we do. Let's just get her guardianized. Let's go to the court and tell them that she's crazy. And tell me some of the crazy things she's done and I'll put it in this petition. We'll get her guardianized. And then she's declared incapacitated and she can't fight you anymore. So this is how bastardized the system has become. And that woman can't do anything about refusing to go into guardianship? No, no. It's a court order. I tell several stories in the book. I try to explain all this, uh, this, the fiber of this system through stories of people who've actually gone through it. And um, I found many women in several states, uh, Florida, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania is a hot spot for this divorce <laughs> business who tell their stories of trying to get out of it, of trying to fight the system. And um, it's really, it's harrowing. It's really a harrowing situation for anybody who finds themselves caught up in it. Is there any way, since this podcast is for seniors, mm -hmm. for the most part, uh, is there any way that, one can protect themselves against being put into a guardianship? I mean, in advance? Such a good question. That is the question. Yes, and I, I have a whole chapter in the book about things you can do. Um, as vulnerable as your will, power of attorney, irrevocable, irrevocable trust, as, as, as vulnerable as all those things are, make them anyway. Be sure that you get those documents in order. Make a power of attorney uh, requ uh, request of someone, but don't just name one person. Name two or three or four people to be successors because the court 
an attorney cannot go in and challenge every single power of attorney designate that you've done. So number one, do that power of attorney. Um, if you know that your children fight among themselves, I suggest, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but this is what I would do. <laughs> I only have one daughter, so I'm, I'm great. But if, if you have children that are bickering, get your cell phone out. Everybody's got a cell phone with a camera, right? Just get your cell phone out and tape record yourself talking about your final wishes. Talk about what you think of a guardianship. Maybe a guardianship is right for you. Maybe you have three people that you would like to be your guardian. Put it on videotape. Talk about the irrevocable trusts that you have. Talk about your end of life decisions. Where do you want to live at the end of your life? Do you want to stay in your house no matter the cost? Do you want to go to a specific home to live? Do you want to go to a specific relative's? to live out the rest of your life? Do you want cremation? Do you want a burial and a public memorial? I know this stuff's hard to talk about, but lay it all out. Because if you put it all on paper and then videotape yourself being of sound mind and body on this date, hold up a newspaper if you have to, to, to uh, mm -hmm. show the date on which you're doing it, it's really, really hard for a judge to ignore those very specific wishes. And, and here's one more suggestion. Get the whole family together, you know, like you would on Thanksgiving, but get everybody around for dinner. Even if they fight with each other, try to get everybody at the same table. Set up your camera and record the session with them talking about all of this. Tell them, this is what I want. This is what your mother wants. This is where we want to go. This is who gets what property. The land in uh, New Mexico goes to you, Billy, and the land in Maine goes to you, Susan, and put it all on videotape. And then put in your documents and on videotape that anybody who contests your wishes is automatically disinherited. That stops a lot of bickering. <laughs> if people know, oh boy, I'm gonna be out in the cold they somehow find a way to, to come together. And the last suggestion is go to family mediation. I know, I know, I know, I, I don't really want to go to any stranger counselor to talk about my inner familiar fighting, but mediation, instead of going to court, is a great first step because professional mediators can heal a lot of family wounds. And a lot of this stuff, Larry, begins because of some childhood slight or some uh, perceived uh, wrong happened 20 years ago and, and the siblings are still mad at each other because of that. So get your documents in order, mediation before court, and do not think that a lawyer is going to help your widowed mother or father live out a fabulous rest of their life because that's not what lawyers are there for. These are I hear tough, the exasperation in your voice. <laughs> no, these, these are tough questions. Yeah. Uh, is, is there anybody who guards the guardians? Anybody who monitors what they do? You, you ask the best questions. And, and th this is a question I've been asking for years. And the short answer is the, the person in charge is the judge. The judge starts a guardianship, allows it to continue, and has the choice to listen or not to the family's complaints about the system. And they're too damn busy. They don't have enough staff, they'll tell you. And frankly, I found some judges that are just control freaks that want it done their way and you can't tell them what to do. So, you know, good luck trying to appeal to the judge to guard the guardian that he appointed or she appointed. Then you go to the police and you say, you know, this guardian won't let me in to see my mom. It says I upset her. For goodness sake, it's my mother. The police will tell you and the district attorney 
and the attorney general's office in your state will tell you, oh, you know, we do criminal things. That's a civil matter. A judge has already ruled. You got to go back to the judge. <laughs> you see the catch 22? Um, so who's guarding the guardians? That's the primary question. And they have all these little laws, like the ones you quoted that have just been passed in Florida and all these other states, but they all have vague language and loopholes that the unscrupulous in this system can get around. It, for example, uh, there's many states have passed a law that says a judge must rule on the least restrictive way to handle this ward of the court. Well, what does that mean? The least restrictive way, they could try to figure out a volunteer group to come and help the person, or they could go with something that's called supported decision-making for this person. But it's easier just to gavel it down and say, okay, guardianship approved, next case. You, you see what I mean? These laws that they're passing always say the guardian should do this and that every year they should file a report. And if they don't, they should be fined. Well, okay, who's going to say what the fine is or should they be? It's, well, now we're back to the judge again. Who's too busy, doesn't have enough staff, or doesn't care. So it, it really is a catch-22. Are these special judges like family court judges or are they just any judge can uh, set up a guardianship? <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it depends on the state that you're in. Um, in Pennsylvania, for example, it's the Widows and Orphans Court Judge. Yeah, that's what they still call it, the Orphans Court Judge. Uh, some places it's a probate court judge. Some places it's a U.S. District Court Judge. No, just a district court judge, not federal. Um, so it depends. But I'll tell you, and I don't, I don't mean any disrespect on this, but it's the fact when you look at the hierarchy of judges, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court, local federal courts, U.S. District Courts, the Court of Appeals, the whatever, all the way down at the bottom is the family court judge or the probate court judge. They're, they're the judges who, you know, they were lawyers and didn't make it in their private practice or you know, whatever. They became a judge. They become an elected official mostly. So, you know... I don't think they have enough training to deal with this problem. And as you know, there is a silver tsunami coming. Baby boomers, we're, we're all getting old. Our parents are really old. And it, this problem is just going to get worse. We've got to get our arms around it. The problem is nobody keeps a database. No state keeps track of how many uh, guardianship cases there are. Federal government doesn't keep track. There's no registry for guardians who have uh, been convicted. And, and more and more guardians are being convicted and sent to federal prison, some of them. So, you know, until we get a big database going, have every state count up how many cases have you had? Who are the judges? Are the judges naming the same guardians over and over again? Are, are those guardians actually giving campaign contributions to these judges? as a way to get more cases. Let's get a database going because unless we know the scope of the problem, we'll never get our arms around it. And they've been talking about getting a database since the 1980s and it still hasn't happened. Gee, I wonder why. You just answered my last question <laughs> uh, about suggestions for improving the system. Yes, I have a whole uh, chapter toward the end of the book about possible solutions. And there are solutions. Things have been changing slowly, slowly in several states. Um, I've mentioned this thing called supported decision making. A, a lot of people under guardianship are um, physically or mentally handicapped. For example, Down syndrome people have been put under guardianship when in fact they can manage their own lives. Uh, I have a case of a young man who, uh, there was an accident at birth, he has a mild case of cerebral palsy. He looks, walks a little different and he speaks a little differently, but he's not stupid, he's under guardianship. So, you know, the, one way to help people like this is this thing called supported decision-making where they have a group of people from state agencies 
their families, their friends that come together and help them make life decisions. Do you want to have that surgery on your back because it might make you feel better? And they talk it through and come to a decision. Do you want to get that apartment or this apartment over there? And they talk, they support the person in making good decisions. And this has been shown to work. I, I, I tell a very touching case of a Down syndrome woman, a pioneer in this supported decision making, um, that shows you it can work. It shows you what people can do for themselves instead of declaring, well, they can't do anything. Let's put them in guardianship. So supported decision making is a good idea. There's something called elder care commissions, and it started there in Florida, where volunteers and paid people, professionals, come in and they sit with the ward. They sit with the elder person. They sit with the physically disabled, whoever the ward happens to be. And they, lo and behold, they ask them, what do you want? I mean, this is the depths of, to which this case, the, this uh, system has gone. We forget to ask the ward, what do you want? So elder care commissions uh, is a very hopeful thing, I think. Um, there's also a movement to um, make these registries for judges and conservators and guardianships for whom there are multiple complaints. Who's complaining? Was there an investigation? Does this person have too many black marks against them? Should they be taken out of consideration for being a court appointee? Um, the, anyway, I could go on and on, but there are things that we could do to change this system, and they're not being done. And I'll tell you, Larry, I think it's because there's a huge lobbying effort in every single state and at the federal level of lawyer groups, guardianship groups, nursing home groups, uh, financial institutions, they, they don't, they, they, there's a whole cadre of people that water down these bills that come out and make them have such vague language that the loopholes are enormous. <laughs> They're just enormous. Tell us again the name of your book and when it'll come out. Well, uh, it, it's called... I want to call it, and I think the publisher is going to go ahead with it, I want to call it The Racket by Diane Diamond. My publisher is Brandeis University Press, uh, and it will be out next year. So early next year, I hope. Uh, th there's a problem in the publishing world now with supply uh, and binding, and you know a lot of it's done in China, and we know the situation with China now. So things are sluggish in the publishing industry, but I hope to get it out next year. It will be out next year. Diane, this has been a very important conversation, and I'm sure the listeners are going to be helped by it tremendously. Thank you so much for coming on specifically for seniors. Thank you for having me, and I agree it is such an important situation and time in our country. It's really a civil rights issue, and I hope people pay attention. Thanks. If you found this podcast interesting, fun, or helpful, we'd appreciate it if you tell your friends and family and click on the follow or subscribe button wherever you listen to podcasts. Until next time, I'm Larry Barsh, and you've been listening to Specifically for Seniors.